That's a 10-week summer program for young people, and then I became an Adler Fellow, and I went on tour with the Western Opera Theater, and then proceeded to um, become an Adler Fellow, and then stayed there for in that program for about three years and started from there and got myself an agent mm -hmm. so but that in in the line of most singers is quite fast i guess so yeah, yeah. really i'm, is. I'm a <laughs> blessed and up. very lucky to have it happen so smoothly i must say um you do mostly coloratura roles and that is your that's your voice that's sure mm -hmm. um I love the bel canto repertoire. Um, I also sing a lot of Mozart mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the French music, so I have a fairly wide range of, as, far, as far as the voice is concerned. So I don't like to box myself in as just a color tour, but I do have that flexibility. Do you enjoy doing um, not only the flexibility in the music, but what, what do you really like on stage? What kind of things yeah. do you feel most comfortable in dramatically? Uh, well, I love to play the saucy, fiery <laughs> kind of soprano roles as the things that I do, Susanna, Rosina. Mm -hmm. um, but I love playing the romance too, as in Juliet and Romeo and Juliet and uh, let's see, you know, the Lucia. One of the operas I've not seen, and I know that it was done, I think, just last year by Opera Orchestra, is uh, Linda de Chamonix. Yes. Uh, tell <clears> us a little about that role. Well, I've never done that role. I know, but you <laughs> sung. You have sung the arias. Well, the arias, yeah. yes, but that's so just, you must uh, know something. Well, about it's an, it's a very standard piece mm -hmm. as far as with my voice category. So, it was a piece that we thought should be on the album, right, Tony? <laughs> and uh, in terms of fireworks and, and oh, there's plenty in that one. Yeah, <laughs> it used to be an aria that I never wanted to do, Why? ever, 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 because everybody did it. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to sing this now. Everybody's doing it, <laughs> but. Um, it ended up being a piece that that sounded really good, at, you know, as far and suited me very well. So I'm saying, "What are you crazy? You need to sing this piece." I said, "Okay, okay, okay, okay." So I ended up doing it. All right, let's hear what this piece sounds like uh, from Donizetti's Linda di Chamonix. We're going to hear the Act One Recitative and Cavatina. The soprano is Ruth Ann Swenson with the London Philharmonic, conducted by Nicola Rechigno. Well, that is fireworks, and that's awfully impressive. Ruth Ann Swenson with the London Philharmonic Orchestra under the direction of Nicola Rechigno in Donizetti's first act aria, uh, actually the recitative and cavatina from uh, Linda di Chamonix. And <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, you just kind of hit the notes, and, and they just sort of float. What, what, what? Thank God. <laughs> is that? No. I mean, there's some technique involved, yes. of course. But I, I really don't sit there and ponder how I'm going to do this note. I just go do for it. it. Yeah. Did it always come easy for you? I, I when I was singing, um, and I was much, much younger. I mean, when I was in my teens, all those notes just sort of flipped out, and everything was very simple. So I didn't worry about technique, and that was a big mistake mm -hmm. because when I got older, I couldn't do it anymore. Well, that's true. Um, of course, most of us are all blessed with a natural yeah. voice that we say, okay, maybe we can have a career with this. But um, I've studied with a man named Dixon Titus, who I really have learned. I give every inch of credit to him for giving me the technique that I have. Um, yes, the notes are in the voice, but you really have to know how to support and, and what you're doing with them as far as you know, getting them out there day, night after night after night. So, um, but I, I just love singing up there. I don't, I don't worry about, oh my God, is my high note, you know, or the high note's going to be there. I think if you do that, you're going to have a lot of problems. You have to just so, have too. confidence that it's going to work and you've studied hard and it's going to be there when you need it. Yeah. It's uh, like going into a marriage. You don't think of it. Exactly. I can get out of this by divorce. You, you go <laughs> really? in and make it work, period. <laughs> um, ever want to be a dancer by any chance? Well, me too, but <laughs> not with this uh, physique, let's oh, just you, say. Oh, you're fine. No, I was but into I, sports and things like mm. that, but not a dancer. I mean, hopefully I move fairly gracefully on yes. the stage. <laughs> You do, but, but um, dance was not one of the things that I, I aspired to. No. Would you mind if we played some ballet music? Oh, I think it'd be wonderful. Okay, it's still from opera. <laughs> I'm June LaBelle, and we're in Tower Records downstairs in the classical department on uh, 66th Street and Broadway, where everything is on sale. Every operatic disc and uh, compact disc, video, laser, everything in the store. So come on in, buy something. Ruth Ann Swenson is with us, and she will be very glad to sign her compact disc, Positively Golden. Ruth Ann, you said while we were listening to the ballet music that uh, you're going to
going to be singing with Seiji Ozawa That's very right. soon. That's right. Um, in the springtime, in March, uh, I make my first trip to Japan, oh, and we do the Barbara Seville. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my first time to work with the maestro, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it, because I hear, I mean, it's just fantastic to work with. So, Is this a, a Japanese company? Is it, uh, wh what company is it? I don't know if it's part of a company. I think it's people he wants to work with, oh. and he decides on the opera, and then he brings everybody over there. Is and it we staged? Performed. It's staged, yes, wow. it's a production. And where do you, do you know where you rehearse? I know we sing in Tokyo, but I'm not sure of the other cities that we do travel to. I know there are several. Mm. <laughs> do you rehearse here, do you know, or, or over there? How does that I work? I think when... we might rehearse here for a while and then take it over. That's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a question about um, vocal technique, and just if you could describe to our listeners what it feels like inside, physically, when you trill. What is that? It's It sounds as if it would feel as if everything would just vibrate. Well, a trill does have to vibrate, mm -hmm. and um, but what does it feel I guess like? uh, it's mostly, I think if you wanted to put one word to it, it's uh, support and on the breath. If it's mm -hmm. not that, you can't do it. Um, it's got to be a supported sound, and it can't be held or else it won't, it won't go back and forth, you know. Does, is there any it's sensation wonder, in the mouth or in the head of something moving, or it, does, it just goes? No, it's, it, you can feel that it's going going to each individual little note mm -hmm. um, when it's correct, hopefully. <laughs> but um, it's not a matter of putting it anywhere. I never think of placing it yeah. anywhere. That's, that's a no-no word in my technical <laughs> formations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, uh, there have been times when I've seen singers, and I'm also the rare times that I've done it myself, where you, could, you just feel as if your head is about to lift and float. Um, describe that for us and under what circumstances, because it's such a wonderful feeling. It is. Um, actually, when you're singing in the upper register, of, especially the sopranos, when they're up there all the time, um, there is a feeling of it coming out of the top of your head. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, usually, it's usually correct if it's doing that. <laughs> That's why I said for me, Although rare the, larynx, times. the larynx is low and the breath is coming and it's free. Um, do, you, you get that sensation of also it coming out of the, out of maybe the top of your forehead, you know, and yeah. out of your eyeballs, and you're going, geez, and I'll stop singing the note and I'll say, geez, I could feel that. It felt like I had a sinus attack or something. <laughs> And, but a good one. and my teacher says, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> it's, so, it's not like playing the violin, it's not like playing the piano where you can see everything. It's, um, it, it's sort of, it's so inside that you have to visualize things and make That's true, you have to remember the head. sensations. Yes. Uh. Because um, it's that, that's what the mind will take over. It'll be into, I call it my little cassette, mm. that becomes second nature. So then when you're going back to these notes or, or this passage, you're not thinking about it anymore. It's, it's really part of your whole technique. Um, how, do you, how long does it take you to prepare for an opera where you really have to be dressed and, and made up? Uh, and what, what opera would, would take a particularly long time? Mm. Well, let me think. Most of the time I go to the theater an hour, half, an hour and a half before the show. Mm -hmm. um, because of the rep that I do, I'm, I'm never really into a lot of heavy um, character makeup. It's usually a young girl. Most of the time I use my own hair, because that's have long one hair, of the time, yeah, long hair. Lucky. And so I can use it a lot on the stage, which I appreciate, because I don't like to wear wigs if I don't have to. Um, I can think of a few times where, like in Zerinetta at the Met a couple years ago, they put me in a dark wig, <laughs> which wasn't my favorite, but it, everyone says, oh, it looks great, it looks great. You look so Italian. You know, a little bombshell or something. I said, oh, okay, whatever you say. But that took a little time because they have to pin my hair up in about 8 million pin curls to get it under the wig right. because I have a lot of hair. So um, it still doesn't take very long because it's, you know, and when you have these professionals doing the makeup, they know what they're doing, they put it on, it's quick, and they know they... You know, you want to get prepared and warm up and do a lot of other things, so they don't take much time. What about recital work? When you're doing a recital as opposed to opera, you're, you're not going through all the changes of costumes and scenery. Uh, do you find it easier or more difficult? Actually, as far as a concert or recital, I'm doing my first recitals coming up in the uh, early winter. Uh, well, actually, January, February months. And uh, Where are they? Well, one's going to be at the uh, Queens College in the series out there, and at the Ambassador mm -hmm. out in L.A., and Omaha, and I think Kansas City. 
So um, really this is the first year I'm really doing it out, taking it on the road, and um, so it's going to be pretty exciting and a little nerve-wracking, but <laughs> um, of course you prepare, you warm up, you get yourself ready, you put your gown on, and you have to do a lot of it yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by this time I've had enough practice, I think I can put myself together, hopefully. <laughs> All right, we're going to go back to the operatic stage and hear another blockbuster, this one by Bellini from Ipuritani. Our soprano, Ruth Ann Swenson, with the London Philharmonic under the direction of Nicola Rechigno. Music by Bellini from Ipuritani, sung for us by Ruth Ann Swenson, our soprano, who is here with us in our first hour. And uh, she's on a recording which is called Positively Golden. I think you'll agree with that. Uh, with the London Philharmonic under the direction of Nicola Rechigno. Um, Positively Golden is on sale here at Tower Records. We're downstairs in the classical department on 66th Street and Broadway, and we invite you to join us. Come on in. Ruth Ann Swenson will be very glad to sign compact discs. There's actually a line here, which well, I would nice. expect for you. <laughs> uh, but uh, just come on in, get on the line, and, and join us. All of the vocal CDs, videos, laser discs, all of that is on sale here at Tower, and we're giving some things away also. We have 10 pair of tickets to the Metropolitan Opera's new production of Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk, uh, which takes place on Tuesday, November 22nd, and 10 pair of tickets are available to the opening of, a, of the uh, performance of the Met's new production of Madame Butterfly, which will be Thursday, December 1st. Um, we just don't have those 10 tickets. In other words, there's a drawing, and you come in and be part of that drawing. Um, Ruth Ann Swenson, do you enjoy making recordings? It's very different from standing in front of an audience. Oh, it is indeed. <laughs> well, this was my first, so actually I did the, um, I did the, uh, what was it? What? what was the other? Kismet. Oh, Kismet. that's right, kind of, yeah. It was, it was fun, but it was mm -hmm. totally different than this. This was... Oh, go into a studio and, and try to do the best you can because you know it's going to be on the record forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it really, it was a tour de force, I'll tell you. I never thought I'd work so hard, but, you know, with John Frazier doing the, the producing, he was fantastic. He gave me so much confidence, and that was half the, the battle to get through there, it. There are, what, basically eight uh, blockbusters on here. Yeah, um, it's not just, you know, little ditties no. that you... Yeah. No, they're really solid. They're really involved, mm -hmm. and to get it together with the orchestra, it was it was hard. Did you do it over a period of time, uh, in one day, in one take? How, how does this kind of thing work when you go into a studio? You're, you're choking. <laughs> well, we had set aside a week, uh -huh. and uh, it took every inch of that week to, to get this out, because mm. the orchestra isn't familiar with all the all these arias, you know. Uh, what about and you? And Rochino was wonderful with them, and he really got the flavor of the bel canto style. Did you know all of these arias before? No, several you? of them I, I did for the first time for this. A lot of the Meyer beer, because it's not done very often. Mm -hmm. The the Huguenot, and um, the um, Linda de Chamonix, and, and Dinora, yes, yeah. definitely. We're, as a matter of fact, we're going to hear Dinora in a couple of minutes. Why don't you tell us a little about this particular <laughs> aria, if you can? This aria, I have heard, because I'm I'm a Maria Callas fan, okay? Mm. So I've heard her, uh, you know, sing this since day one. And I said, geez, I, I, I gotta sing this someday. I do, I have to. I don't know how I'm gonna sing it, but I'm gonna sing it if it kills me. And I would always say, oh no, well, I, you know, you never do the opera, because I don't do it very often mm -hmm. either. And uh, when we had the opportunity to include it on the album, I said, okay, this is my chance. This is it, this is it. I'm gonna learn this like within an inch of its life and do the best I can. Of course, it's not gonna be like Maria, but I'll get, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right, let's see what you did. From uh, Dinora by Meyerbeer, The Shadow Song, sung for us by soprano Ruth Ann Swenson. Um, I first, got interested again when um, there was interest in bringing back the ballad of Baby Doe. Now, I, my interest in Baby Doe, obviously, is not a financial one. We all signed away our interest in that. In fact, my interest in the recordings is not financial since the money goes to charity anyhow. So I don't pay attention to it in terms of, of um, how well it's going to sell. I'm delighted if it sells well. But, but I think in order for these things to happen, it's kind of like another career. If, if you want to have a singing career, you have to pursue it. You have to have a manager who arranges auditions and gets you heard. I didn't even know where the records were, and I couldn't have cared less. Um, I remember getting a phone call from Lou Wasserman some years ago, 
who, when I was a little girl, was my Uncle Lou, you know, yeah. when I was the tiny child prodigy. And he said, hey, Bubbles, guess who owns your records? And I didn't know what he was talking about. He had bought a collection, and in them were some of the uh, Westminster records. So um, when the Ballad of Baby Doe came, and then there seemed to be interest in some of my recordings, um, Edgar Vincent, who has been my manager and mentor, uh, I asked him to get actively involved in it. And he did, and, and as a result, these things happened. The, the cover was produced, and the the original uh, liners, you know, the uh, yes, stories that the, yeah. were, were reproduced, which I kind of liked. And uh, it, it it has just happened. So I um, I'm as I'm as delighted uh, over the re release of the Ballad of Baby Doe as well. I'm I'm tickled that they're coming out. But recording careers uh, come when you actively pursue them like you pursue business yeah. and we never did that and the truth of the matter is I was sitting in my apartment one day and John Ardoin the critic from Dallas called and, and I invited him to come over and have a little tea or whatever and he said have I got a surprise for you and he came and somehow he got in his hands on the masters of a, a Verity recording that I had started and gotten ill in London and never finished. And later they sort of pieced it together from, with excerpts from Traviata and other things and, and released it in vinyl. I mean, it was not on the... I don't think it ever made a CD. And I said, where did you get that? He said, oh, it's, it's, it's roaming around now. The masters are... And he knew exactly where they were. So un unless you really follow this through, it, it, it doesn't happen. Also, you know, there's a whole generation of young people, I think, who don't know who Beverly Sills was or what kind of career it was. They know me in a different context. Mm. Um, and it's a whole new public. I mean, but I was shocked the other day to learn there's a whole new generation who doesn't know who Adolf. That sort of shocked me much that's, more than, you know, than who cares who Beverly shocking. Sills was. But um, <clears throat> I, I have learned that they're selling like hotcakes, which tickles me a lot. I would certainly like them to be successful. Well, look, uh, nearly 30 years have passed, and I'm amazed at what you told me, because the LPs for a long time were available on, on the ABC label right. after Westminster, and then, of course, they disappeared because all kinds of things disappeared in this crazy yeah, business. Well, we were into other things, yes. and um, I, you know, I was, I'm, I met a very famous singer, somebody that I admired enormously, and um, a luncheon was given for her, and I attended, and I said, how are you? She said, okay. I said, are you teaching? No. I said, what are you doing? She said, well, I stay at home most of the time and play my records and cry. Mm. And I thought, whoops, that's not, that's not appealing to me. Mm. Um, but I, I never retired, uh, really. I, I just stopped singing and moved on to something else. Yeah. Well, that's unique and unusual, and I'd like to think that the example you just cited of the other prima donna who sits home and cries is the other extreme, and I hope that somewhere there are something a in number the of <laughs> opera singers in between who are neither as unbelievably active as you are, nor as unbelievably sad and tragic as the other lady. I'm sure, I'm sure there are quite a few sitting I, there. I, I hope so. <laughs> uh, now, uh, returning to this wonderful trilogy, which I'm sure is selling like hotcakes, <laughs> uh, how did this whole project originate? Back in, in the late 60s, you were already, that was your post-Julius Caesar phase, yes. and you were already a star at the city opera. The breakthrough had already happened, and how did this project came about? Well, come after about? the Cleopatra, uh, Julius Rudell called Norman Tregel and me into the office, and we had one of our long meetings, and Julius said to me, what do you think your next project should be? And I said, without a moment's hesitation, Manon. And he said, done, we'll do that one together. Um, and then Norman was sitting there, and Norman wanted to do Coq d'Or. So um, Julia said, 
you know, there's a wonderful Queen's role in there for you. So I said, wonderful. We grabbed it. So I think the cock door was in between Cleopatra and the Manon. But the Devereaux was presented to me just along the time that I was uh, working Manon with Julius mm -hmm. um, by my coach, Roland Gagnon. And he said, I want you to take this score home and, and play it. I, I did. I took it home. Um, and usually, I read the text first. But Roland was so excited about it musically that I just sat at the piano and sort of worked it through. And I said to him, I'd like to do it, maybe at a later date. But I, I really would like to look at Lucia and, and um, you know, some other stuff first that I have never had the opportunity to do in New York. Go home, he said, and take this and read this, the text. Don't look at the music. And I read the text just as if I was reading a play. And I was really hooked on it. Um, it did not start out as a, a project of three queens. It started out with Elizabeth, period. Um, and later, when Roland suggested that we take a look at Bolena, which uh, mm -hmm. Maria Callas had done with great success, Roland was smarter then. And he just sent me the mad scene from Anna Bolena, those mm. beautiful three yes. interla interlaced uh, yes. arias. The finale, um, actually. Right. Yes. And um, naturally, I was very taken with her. And then the Stuarda, and it, it was really at, at, at Roland's urging, and to Julius's credit, that he bought the project. Um, because, uh, you know, bel canto is not the most interesting repertoire for conductors. And yet he did, t Julius did take the time to go through it and, um, and, and agree that it was a, a good and interesting mm -hmm. project. And then when he brought Capobianco into it, and Capobianco sort of outlined how we could interlace some of the sets and the costumes that, you know, the thrones, the, the, mm -hmm. the fact that um, Elizabeth was the daughter of of, of Henry VIII, VIII, you know, so, I mean, it, it, it was a, a very interesting theme, and it grew and grew, and we all got very excited about the project. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you were drawn to uh, Deborah, in other words, uh, Queen Elizabeth at an advanced age. Yes. And uh, George, you know my favorite story? At the beginning of my career, when I was doing Manon and the old lady, Elizabeth, I love to say that it took me 15 minutes to become Manon and two hours to become the old lady. And towards the end, it took me two hours to become Manon and 15 minutes to become the old lady. And I knew it was time to leave. You're exaggerating. <laughs> no, I knew it was time to call it quits. But, uh, <laughs> but obviously, that required an enormous amount of makeup. Yes. I'm talking about Elizabeth, of course. And uh, from what I was told, very, very heavy costuming. Right. 55 pounds, the first costume was. Yes, incredible. Uh, they devised, Mrs. Capobianco, uh, Gigi, uh, devised suspenders that hooked onto the waist and to the, uh, so that a lot of the weight was borne yes. from the shoulders and the waist. Yes. Uh, you know, we sort of split it up, but it was exhausting. But it did help me walk like an older woman. Yes. There, was, there was no way to have quick movements in that costume. Mm -hmm. And the, each time she went up to the throne, Yes. Um, that the weight of that costume yes. uh, helped me to show the, the to show weight the age of, 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 of the age. The, yes. uh, and the age because of mentally you were too young to identify with, with the character, although you, I, I imagine you lived the character. I read so much about it. I have a very extensive uh, uh, library of books yes. on, on this woman. Uh, the astonishing thing was, of course, in her time, she was really, at one point, the most powerful woman in the world. And women were never really looked upon as, as uh, powerful objects. And yet this woman literally ruled the world yes. at some yes. point. Um, and it was astonishing how, how long she lasted. Yes. That wasn't assassinated, nobody chopped her head off. You know, well, she, she did uh, some assassination. <laughs> she did a share of her own, <laughs> yes. Own, yes. <laughs> Do as <laughs> I make, say, or... <laughs> to make sure to remove uh, objects, uh, any, 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 any threats to her throne, of course, Maria Stuarda was the main uh, threat to her throne. Oh, yes. 
This is a crucial moment for Queen Elizabeth toward the end of the opera as Roberto Devereux, the Earl of Essex, is led to his execution, a tragic fate that the operatic queen takes very, very tragically. History tells us a different story. I'm talking with Beverly Sills about her recordings of the Tudor queens, and more will follow in a moment. My guest is Beverly Sills. We already heard a scene from Donizetti's Roberto Devereux. How do you compare these three queens in terms of vocal challenges? From a vocal point of view, Stuarda was the easiest. Mm -hmm. um, he got her character, which was very feminine, um, with the exception of the one famous, you know, Ville Bastarda scene. Oh, yes, the duet with... The, uh, uh, all of the, the music is reflective of a very, very female yes. person. So that for my voice, the femininity was um, very easy for me to convey because it, it was in a very healthy tessitura for me. Uh, naturally, the Donizetti orchestrations are never overwhelming, so you never have to really fight the way you have to do in a Strauss or a right. Verdi orchestration. Um, my disappointment with Donizetti's Stuarda is that he was a passionate woman who who ruled and 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 lived from her heart, really. Yeah. And there isn't a love duet in it. There wasn't one passionate love scene. I was so frustrated over that. Yes. I just felt if one moment everybody could go off stage and leave her yes. with this man. Well, that, with Lester, you mean? Yes. Well, that was historically inaccurate anyway. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the whole thing is historically inaccurate. And yes. since it is, I wish he could have stretched it right. six more minutes more. and yeah. given me some sort of passionate moment with this man so that you really see that this woman... Yeah, but you had a lot of passion vis-a-vis -vis Elizabeth. Uh, yes, but... Um, not the same. Not the same. Not, the same. not, not no. the same kind. We heard the finale of Donizetti's Maria Stuarda, which you call the easiest of the three roles, and we heard a brief contribution by tenor Stuart Burroughs as Lester in the final scene as Maria, the Queen of Scots, goes to her death. Now tell us about Anna Bolena. The Bolena was, uh, for me, the, the, the finale of the opera is, is worth everything. I, I don't know of a more, uh, that the, what we call the home sweet home aria, yes. and followed by that brilliant cabaletta. Oh, yes. I, I just, um, I, I, those, I couldn't wait for that scene to come. Yes. I simply could not wait. Yes. And, then they were, and f for me... With all those thrills. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, for me, Bolena has some extraordinarily beautiful music. No missing duets there. Right. I mean, uh, the, the, the duet with the mezzo is an extraordinary duet. And yeah. I, I felt Bolena was a very satisfactory character to play. Yes. Um, the, the three moods of the finale, uh, I had read in one of my books that uh, she was on morphine. She was so frightened mm. of, the, of the coming execution yes. that she was just stoned <laughs> for most of yes. for her last days. Yes. And the, in the Cabaletta, the, those trills and Roland, who ornamented it for me, added three or four to them. I wanted to get the hysteria Yes. from this woman. Um, I, I, I loved Bolena. I mm. really did. Uh, I, I had in my mind what I wanted her to look like. Um, I, I, Bolena gave me great satisfaction, great mm. satisfaction. That was the sizzling finale of Donizetti's Anna Bolena. A few words you wanted to add about Maria Stuarda, and then we'll close up with a few other reminiscences of your glorious career. As I said, uh, vocally, Stuart was a pushover for me. There wasn't a hurdle in it. I didn't have yeah. to think or worry about anything there and could concentrate on her character as best I could. And I thought Capobianco staging at the end in that brilliant red dress and her head on the guillotine and thumping three times on, yes. the, on, the, on the wood yes. and then the blackout. And yes. our one night, a woman brilliant. yelled, "No, no!" You know, they, they were so caught up, and it. it was really yes. wonderful. I, I, the staging. By the way, that black 
dress was historically accurate. Yes, that I, I, we tried to get a few little things. You know, yes. the the fifty five pound gown in Devereaux was taken from the Tate Gallery. It was, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the the yeah. pearls and everything was was duplicated, and that was kind of nice. Um, but in the final analysis, uh, in looking back at my career, where I'll probably, if I'm known at all, they'll say, well, you know, it was was the best Manon of its time there, and it probably should have been because I, I could sing it and I looked the part, I was fluent in French, everything was, you know, everything was going for me in Manon. There was no reason why, God willing, all went well. It shouldn't have been the success that it was. And Julius and I got enormous satisfaction from our Manon. How it will be rem remembered by other people, I don't know, but some of our most joyous moments were walking off that stage together after the right. last bow, knowing what we had just done. But from my point of view, I felt Cleopatra and Mano had no hurdles for me, and I, I should have been able to do it well. My, I think my finest accomplishment in my mind will always be the Queen Elizabeth, because I couldn't look in the mirror and say, well, you look the part, so you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Um, how, how you play the role of a, a, a woman about whom so much has been written, so much is known, so much a part of history, um, was a great challenge to me. Um, and in a funny way, although the orchestrations are equal in the three operas, because the text is so important in Devereaux, um, I felt it necessary really to weigh down on my voice in a way that I did not do. Bolena was medicine for me. When I finished Bolena, I could have sung her again. And certainly with two artists, and she's only in half the opera, anyhow, I probably could have sung her three times again. Mm -hmm. But uh, when the curtain came down on Devereaux, I was emotionally spent and vocally quite close to using what I used to call vocal capital. Mm -hmm. I could not have sung uh, much more when the curtain came down, and I knew that. Um, I was exhausted when the performance was over, was physically, vocally, and emotionally. Mainly emotional? Or, yes, or she took a great deal well. out of me. Yes. It was very difficult to pace her mm -hmm. uh, because I got so carried away with her. And mm -hmm. that text, that text, I, it was so important to me. Even in those days, there were no super titles, but it, I just felt it, by body language, somehow I had to get the the fabric of this woman across yes. to the public this extraordinary uh, did the uh, the finale of it Vivi Tirano and the others was it a particularly trying experience for yes, you it was, oh, it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, also it it was interesting a, a discussion that Tito Capobianco and I had was that in in the books I had read Elizabeth was so frightened of she didn't want to die and so she spent a great deal of her time standing up because she felt that people die only when they're, they're lying, lying down, down. <laughs> and yet in the final scene he wanted me to do it sitting on the throne because he his and he convinced me and I, and he was right of course whenever she got in trouble whenever things collapsed around her, she retreated up those four steps to the throne. Mm -hmm. uh, that was her haven, her protection. She felt invulnerable when she was sitting in that throne. Nobody could touch her. The minute she came down, she felt very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So that he wanted her in all her moments of need to get to that throne, even if yes. it, these were her last steps. Let me ask you this. We are thinking now 30 years back. Did you ever imagine yourself as being chairman of Lincoln Center <laughs> 30 years later and Placido Domingo being what he is today? No. You know, King of the world. Shall I tell you that on When I recorded this with Tommy Shippers, um, Giancarlo was at the studio that day. And if you don't think I was scared, I was scared because his, <laughs> he's sitting in the studio watching me do this, you know. Yeah. But um, it's... Uh, it's a tremendous thing. It's a tremendous thing to sing, and you have to. I have to be in such control that I can't let. Uh, I can't let my emotions get to me too much because I'll start to cry, mm. and I can't sing and cry at the same time. What was his reaction when he heard it? Oh well, see, he thought I could do no wrong anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't make any difference. He's wonderful to work with. Yes. Oh yes, I've known Giancarlo for years. Mm -hmm.
tough, discerning, sensitive singing actor, not just a heroic tenor, but a thinking heroic tenor, John Vickers has made the role of Peter Grimes virtually his own. Our broadcast producer, Marilyn Merker, who knew Vickers when he performed the part with the San Francisco Opera, asked him to elaborate on his interpretation. The first time I ever was associated with Peter Grimes was years and years ago when I was a student of music, really, the concert of music in Toronto. And uh, I sang in the chorus of Peter Grimes at that time. And from the very first introduction of the work, to me there was a, an absolutely impossible contradiction within the opera, within the character of Peter Grimes. And it was such a conflict that I came to the conclusion that there must be a key that would unlock that conflict. I disagree with those who say the original concept was one of a misguided uh, poetic uh, person. That was not the original concept. The original concept was of a fisherman in a situation that was rejected by a community because he chose to be different or because he was different because he was suspected of beating little boys, because he was suspected, or was, a homosexual. When I was first asked to do the part by Sir Rudolf Bing in the Metropolitan Opera Company, I told him that I wanted to speak with a producer before I would sign the contract, because I wanted to tear this opera right out of the grasp of what I thought was a limiting concept where it was a specific situation in a specific locale with a specific group that wanted understanding and compassion. And I wanted to rip it right out of that concept and transfer it into a universalized, timeless concept of the whole psychology of human rejection. Because in the anguish of Ben Britton in those years, and he was an anguished person in those years. Mm -hmm. He was in self-exile in a way, out here in California, not thought of kindly by the British people because he'd run away from what he thought was the war. Mm -hmm. He was, at that time, a practicing homosexual with Peter Beers as his love, and that was a, a taboo a real taboo in those years. Oh, yes. And the, the whole of this agony produced this soul-searching gut reaction of Ben Britton to try to win understanding and compassion for himself and Peter in the world. It was autobiographical. I am absolutely convinced that it was autobiographical. So you feel it was a but, conscious... Thing. But in this conscious effort, mm -hmm to write this work of his own anguish, he did not realize what a tremendous, universal, timeless subject that he dealt with. And the homosexual world is totally wrong if they believe that they're the only people who ever feel rejected. We've all suffered the anguish of human rejection. We all know what it's about. And so, Having come to this conclusion, I sought to find verification for it. And in my study of all the writings of Crabbe, in the biography of Crabbe, which was written by his son, mm -hmm. eh, every piece of research I did convinced me that the Peter Grimes that is spoken of in the poem by Crabbe has nothing whatsoever to do with the opera. Bernheimer talks about, in his review, about me turning Grimes into a brute. He is not a brute. There is some misconception in the world today that just because a man can be physically strong and carry out acts of physical strength, that automatically he has no sensitivities, that his inner life is not one of poetry and beauty do you understand? I, there, this is a misconception in our society today. Eh? But I think he acknowledges that what you do is show the brutish side as well as that sensitive aspect which a person can have. Yes, there is a side where a man of physical strength 
if he reacts to goading and Grimes is goaded, then they say he's a brute. A person of not physical strength who is goaded runs into a corner and can be weak, physically weak. But that is just the, the difference in two reactions of two human beings. Uh, just because a man reacts to goading doesn't necessarily turn him into a, a brute. And Grimes, there is nothing, there is nothing in Grimes where he is a brute with that boy. Absolutely. Nothing. Right. Absolutely right. nothing. And the poetry of the inner searching of this man that is revealed in the now the great bear and the Pleiades, what earth moves are drawing up the clouds of human grief. Those are not the words of a brute. Of course not. And, and so I reveal this strong, independent, ab abrasive human being. He's abrasive, but he's not a brute. Huh? And he is determined to walk his own path. But anyone in this world that accomplishes anything does that. But adding that dimension simply makes the tragedy so much more profound. Of course it does, because it universalizes the subject. The subject matter is not of a man whether he is a black isolated in a white community, whether he is a homosexual isolated in a community of heterosexuals, whether he is a Japanese isolated in a situation of Americans. It is not petty. These subjects aren't subjects for great works of art. Great works of art deal with timeless, universal subjects. They, they probe at the profound meaning of a search for truth, or they're not works of art. And this is a great work of art. Do you think Britain was even aware of the, uh, the magnitude of what he had I done? I don't think any artist has any concept of the magnitude of his contribution. The creative artist? No, I don't believe any artist is. I don't believe that Michelangelo had a clue of his greatness. I don't think that Benvenuto Cellini or Leonardo da Vinci or Rembrandt or Turner I don't think any of them had any concept of the magnitude of their greatness. Because works of art are far greater than the artist. And to an extent it is true. And it's, it's a mystery. It is a real mystery that the artist is an instrument through which something flows that's bigger than him. Anyone who sees your performance of Grimes or listens to it and it is certainly reflected in your voice, and that is the terrific emotionality of the role that is required and that you put into your portrayal. It must be very difficult to submerge yourself into that character emotionally, dramatically. Does this take a toll on you, John no, Vickers? Not, not really, Marilyn. When you're finished with the performance. The toll that really taken out of me is the intensity of concentration that's required but from a standpoint of sort of raking my own emotions no I couldn't do that if I raked my own emotions if I was suffering those emotions they would not be conveyed to the audience the audience would only see a, a silly man up on the stage who became emotionally involved and it would embarrass the audience I have to convince the audience that Grimes is weeping that Grimes is heartbroken <laughs> uh, I want to say something, though, uh, because you, you touched on it over this very subject of emotion. There is today, in the whole of the music world, uh, a great smearing taking place in the line between artifice and art, between entertainment and artistic entity. The operatic art form is a form that remains an art form so long as it appeals to the intellect. It has to appeal to the intellect like a great painting. It appeals to the intellect through the senses. But there is a tremendous, tremendous smearing of this line that's taking place today. And we are satisfying ourselves too often with just appealing to the senses. 
and we must not be confused. That is not art. That is artifice. That is entertainment. That is titillation. That is hysteria. But that is not intellectual pursuit of excellence, nor pursuit of a search for truth. And I'm very concerned that I see that infecting the upper world. Because my emotionalism is emotionalism for a purpose, to, to serve a higher purpose of getting through the emotions of the individual to serve an intellectual end. I draw the audience into my arms and I say, come up here on the stage with me. Feel these emotions, feel this anguish, feel this rejection, and go away and think about how you treat your fellow man. How could I possibly stand before the majesty of a work like Peter Grimes and feel anything but humility? How is it possible? Anyone who believes that they should use a work of art for their personal glorification just absolutely appalls me. Who do we think we are that we would dare to use Verdi or Wagner or Britain or Mozart for our glorification? That's, that's madness. At the same time, through you, you can reveal to a larger public what the creator of the work may be intended. Or but that's my job. That's your job. It's my job to reveal Grimes, not to say, look at me, to look at Grimes. I want Tristan to be... And, and I, I think that to some extent I have succeeded in that. I think people like to come and, and, and see Grimes, not come and see Vickers. Uh, you know, here I am, and in a way I resist, as you know, I resist interviews like mad mm -hmm. because the fact that I give an interview tends to put myself between the audience and the work. I don't want an image between the audience and the work. I want the audience just to see the work. That's all. And it's my job to reveal it in the most complete way that I am capable of intellectually, vocally, physically, emotionally. emotionally. Well, I'm very happy that you consented to give the interview. Oh, Marilyn, it was a pleasure. I, to, it was a pleasure to, but uh, I just don't like inflating the personality so that they, it gets between the, the audience and the, and the works I sing. I understand. And also, you need a private... Oh, I'm a very private person. You are, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it was wonderful seeing oh, you, you and talking you, with you. Thank you, Thanks. It was a pleasure to see you again.